Good evening and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings you the news, the Constitution, and the complete analysis to you each month. Good evening. My name is James Barrett, and tonight with Mark Malakowski, we're here on three exciting subjects. Mark, what are we starting with tonight? Well, the first thing we're going to talk about this evening is uh, 1031 exchanges, and this is a tax issue that has to do with capital gains. Well, I'm going to ask you about this. I, I have a, some knowledge on it, but why don't you explain what is a IRS 1031 exchange? Okay, now what happens when you're, uh, it's with the, usually with real property here, and when you sell a property, you have to be very careful not to take the money out of escrow until you see if you have a, a, a good candidate for a 1031 exchange. Because if you take the money out of escrow and it actually goes into your name, you've lost your opportunity to use a 1031. Yeah, but isn't a 1031 only applied to like commercial properties, your second home, and things like that? It doesn't apply to your normal home that you would be living in. Well, generally you're talking about investment properties, okay? And what happens is, particularly right now, because in our uh, last segment we're going to be talking about uh, Obamacare and the 7% the, the Obama tax on capital gains. And uh, that could have been repealed a few weeks ago and that didn't make it through the, the Congress. So right now, uh, Obama moved capital gains up from 15 to about 22% or something in there, right? So, yes. so um, and also you, you also have a 3.3% tax for the California Franchise Tax Board. So you're talking in the, in the area about 25%. So let's say you have a, a property, $10 million, okay? So $2.5 million of that is gonna go to capital gains, you're going to lose that to the federal government, right? Well, the, the, the problem with the 1031 is it's got so, a lot of restrictions. And the, the, the problem lies on you have to identify your property ahead of time that you're going to exchange. And normally it's like a commercial, say a commercial building. You have to identify a like property that you're going to take the money you get for the sale of that commercial property and then roll it into the new property and you effectively don't get taxed on the the benefit of the sale of your original property now the problems are are timelines because first you have to identify the property almost immediately while you're in the process and then you have 45 days to commit to that property and you have up to 100 and, I believe it's 106 months for your final conclusion and the close of escrow on the second property. Now, the problem with this is, if you don't do that, you lose automatically and you fall into the capital gains tax. Okay, so let's look back at kind of the philosophical reason that they put this in the tax code, if there's any reason at all for tax ah, codes. Taxes, but uh, what, 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 legal, what, did, what did Leote <laughs> saying said 2,000 years ago, taxes are not raised for the benefit of the tax, that's for sure. But uh, the idea is, is that you want the investor class, people who are investing to put the money back into the economy. You don't want them just to take their money and sit on it. So what this does is gives you a chance to defer that capital gain if you're willing to reinvest it. Now, why is that would scare people? Of course, anytime you invest things, you're taking another risk. Instead of taking the money and saying, okay, I've got this money, I can hold on to it. Anytime you buy, you buy another property, you're taking a risk that the value of that property will go down or a lot of things could happen. So this is to encourage people to reinvest the money that they're taking out of the, the profit they made on their last property. And the idea is that, you know, from an operational standpoint, they have what they call an accommodator. You want to put that money that you made from your last property sale into the accommod accommodator, and then you have 45 days after that closing of the first property to identify your new property. Now, if you don't find another property, you can take the money out of the accommodator and, and you'll fall under the capital gains you'll tax. fall under the capital gains you won't lose without the money. penalty well there is a slight fee you're in a you know eight hundred dollar fee or thousand dollars you know somewhere for in the that accommodator area. for the accommodator to set it up so you might your broker is going to make another thousand bucks yeah. or something like that but you can always pull the money back out so you're not going to lose it but if you take the money out of escrow before you put it in the accommodator then you've lost your opportunity. Yeah, That's because, what people don't understand. Yeah, there's a finite window, and you can't be holding the money. That's the whole point. You can't let it come into your possession. No, no, the broker holds it. The it's broker in, holds it. You it's don't do anything As with soon it. as you touch it, that's too late. It's, it goes from the broker to the accommodator, from the accommodator into the new property. Now, there's things you can do with the money out of the accommodator. You can 
take uh, take out loans and match that and buy another, a bigger piece of property. Now, what your what your hope would be is to buy a piece of property partially with a loan, partially with the money you made that you're not going to hit get hit with that tax, and then you would try to get you know some return on that property. So you. You know, if you were like renting retail spaces or a shopping center, you would have a return on your money, and hopefully that return on that money, the profit you're making off that property, that's an income property, is more than you're paying on your mortgage and interest, and, and so you're, you're taking a couple of percent there. Well, actually, there's, a, there's an interesting couple of things. You know, the 1031 has uh, subsections A through, A through H, and so there's a series of different transactions you can go through. But that, that's a lot more complicated. I think we would have to spend a lot of time on that. But the, the key points are is you can't take any of the money out right, without losing the ability. And then the next point is you can actually buy a property. But the key point, it has to be a like property. You can't, you can't move from one type of commercial property to something that's completely different. Because there's wording that says it's supposed to be like property. Now. There is one thing you can do. You can buy a property, another commercial property, for less, and then they have what's called the boot. And the boot, you can take the money out, and you only get your capital gains on the, on the amount of money that's the boot. Right. Now, they don't call it the boot, but they, that's effectively what the generic term in the industry is. So you can actually benefit from a 1031 and get some cash out and paying less capital gains because you're only taking a percentage out, but still have the tax status and the savings by putting the rest of the money from your original sale into a, a, a property with, that costs less. So there's actually, you can kind of manipulate a little bit, but one thing you can't do is add money. You can never add money to your money and say, "Whoa, I want a higher tax bracket. Ah, I'm out of this." Well, no, yeah, okay. So there's, but there, but also you can use loans to supplement your. You next, can use loans. loans to supplement your next investment. Now, you know, if the interest rates are low enough, and you're saving enough on your going through your 1031 exchange, and you've got an income property that's that's producing some income. You know, you can say, "Hey, look, I just made 25 percent here, mm -hmm. and if you're picking up another two percent." you know, per year on that for the next five or 10 years. That, and if you're dealing in a, you know, like say if you're in a five, 10 million range, that, that comes to some real money. Well, it does. And so, and it's really worth looking at. Now, the, uh, the other issue is that you can't invest overseas. You've got to invest. It's in got to be, if it's in country, it's got to be in it's country. Get, well, it's got to be in the United States. You can't put it overseas. Um, and even if it's a like uh, <clears throat> investment, the, the, the states of the United States are so, are so different that you can take a, a property that you're renting here with so many, you know, like a quarter acre and maybe buy 10 acres in Idaho to do the same kind of thing. So, you know, and then maybe get a slightly large, less return, but take less of a risk. So there's a lot of things you can do even with like properties. Well, what, that's interesting about like properties. The, the factor that because of the states, like in California, you can sell a property that's worth a million dollars and you have a million dollars net. Right. And you take that money and roll it into the state of Tennessee and right. you're going you, to go from a quarter acre that's to I'm the saying. 10 acre deal. That's what I'm saying. And, but they still consider it a like property right, right. if it's an income generating property. Well, and also... Not only are you talking about like properties, but you can have like properties that have various degrees of risk and return too. You know, so like say you're looking at professional buildings, that's one kind of risk. You're looking at retail buildings is another. Looking at agriculture is another type of risk. So there's different grades of risk depending on how how rich you feel in your blood or how much how, how much, lucky do you how feel? How lucky do you feel? So you know, even with like properties, you say, okay, this is a rental income property, and, and so you've got a fair amount of leeway there. And, you know, and sometimes you can go and say, um, when, when you're looking at your properties, I mean, the tricky part is this 45 days is going out searching for your property. You should be looking at your, for your property before you even sell your first property. Well, it's, 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 it's kind of leaning well, well, in that a lot, direction. A lot of people who do this, this is, they do this all the time. Right. It's right. just something they do every other weekend just because that's part of their business. Um, but, I mean, you can do, you can look at three different properties. Um, or you can look at more, but, but you can't uh, exceed your twice your 1031 funds with the accommodator. So you can look at several different properties and identify these. And so you've got some time to decide, but you have to identify 
these three properties I think on that pretty note, quickly. I think on that note, we'll leave this because actually it's very complicated. And I think we should move on to our next subject. What's our next subject tonight, Mark? Okay, well, this is kind of a landmark uh, situation is Neil Gorsuch is the new... Uh, uh, SCOTUS uh, Supreme Court number nine uh, 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 justice and uh, Neil was uh, I guess tested by fire going through these things they call the murder boards uh, going through these interrogations because he you know in Congress or you know was going to be very tough on him and the Senate the Senate was being very tough on them and the press and everybody was being very tough on him um, he came from uh, I guess a, a certain bank of judges that had been identified by a certain organization that was pretty conservative. So you had a lot of the liberals. Tenth district. Yeah, well, but I mean, as far as but there was a, a group of uh, a group of people that said this is a, this is a set of judges that we like, and that kind of started a wildfire of dissent against him. So well, he knew he, was, he, knew well, he was going to face some yeah, uh, opposition. Yeah. Well, the problem is, as you know, the um, the um, the Republican dominated Senate and during the last year of the Obama presidency denied Garland, right. Justice Garland, from having the opportunity to for even have for a vote. And because even though there's the Biden rule, which said no, no president should be able to appoint a Supreme Court justice during the last year, and Biden, of course, used that during the Bush presidency, right. and which set up the Biden rule. Right. So now the, the Democrats have forgotten the Biden rule, even though Biden, the vice president, is the one that designed it. Uh, and they said, you must give Merrick Garden, Garland a, an up or down vote last year. So... They didn't. In fact, uh, the head of the Senate decided that I'm not going to give him a vote and didn't even have an interview with him. So this year, after January 20th, when the new president came in, and of course he nominated right off the list he gave everyone during, right. the, during his election process, he picked the first time a judge has been unanimously recommended by the ABA, every, every attorney board across the country. He was a uh, intern under Justice White and he, Justice Kennedy. He clerked for Kennedy. He clerked for Kennedy and Justice White, two Supreme Court justices. Right. And ten he, years on the, was he at ten years in appeals? Yes, he was in appeals. And he has over 212 decisions that he wrote himself. And they were all, all the ones that went to the Supreme Court and then, were and, and you've also got to look at, you know, if someone's a clerk for the Supreme Court, I mean, the, the clerks do a lot of work. They do all the work. They do, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't want to say that because I, I, well, be, I have to go before judges. Most of the work. I, I have to go Part before, of the work. Because yeah. I have to go before judges. But they all do, the time. They, you know, but they, clerks do a lot of the work. Correct. And so if you look at what uh, Justice Kennedy said in, in, his, in his briefs and one thing or another, you got to say, okay, um, you know, Neil probably wrote, a fair amount of those, right? Uh, yes. So, so, so we can look so at I mean, Kennedy so as well you can, so you can and look, White. Yeah, you can look at look at those briefs, look at those, not necessarily the decisions so much, but at the briefs, right? Right. And say that's probably some of Neil's work there, yes, too. Yes, correct. So, I mean, he has a huge record to look at. And, you know, he's, um, uh, well, I, I guess, from the Midwest, so he's a little bit boring. He's from Colorado. From, yeah, from the, you know, from the New York people and the California people don't like him because he's, he's kind of the boring. Middle. He's a yeah. boring guy, yeah. Well, I want to add something here um, about Mr. Gorsuch. When he was nominated to, to get to the 10th, 10th Circuit, he was unanimously voted on by the Senate, right. which was in the control of the Democrats. And, and I, now, now a lot of those senators voted against him. And now the senators come out saying, what an evil man. Mm -hmm. But well, in I mean, fact, just, it was yeah. all about who recommended him, who nominated him. Yeah, well, I think I think what you now you know there's a huge, huge division in the country, um, whether the Constitution is is a written document that is a contract between the government and the people, or whether the Constitution is a living document that can kind of be changed based on whoever's in charge at the moment. Neil's an originist, uh, and, originalist. Yeah, so. There's a huge thing. Now, Scalia was very much a strict constitutionist, very much originalist, died under pretty suspicious circumstances, very suspicious. to say the least. Right before major, three yeah. major decisions, With by no, the way. No autopsy. Now, I'd say no, if, it, now if We've Obama, covered this before. But I mean, if Obama, we should leave it alone tonight. Okay, okay, if, okay. I'm just saying, 
Somebody that important with, with no autopsy that. It's very and soon. no bodyguard. He's yeah. supposed to have a U.S. Marshal oh, with yeah, him no all the time. No oh, magically, he didn't have a U.S. Marshal that night. <laughs> but anyway, so one night, he mysteriously anyway, dies. Anyway, very, yes, we know very, that. very, very, very suspicious circumstances, I would say. Um, an unfortunate passing. Um, kind of like Ted Stevens. Oh, Ted Stevens. <laughs> you mean the 60th vote <laughs> with his replacement on the yeah, Obamacare. Yeah. Yes, yeah, let's talk. Okay, so anyway, um, Gorsuch uh, graduated from Columbia, Harvard, and Oxford, um, clerked for two Supreme Court justices, and did a stint at the Department of Justice. Highly regarded. And so what the Democrats did, or Schumer did, is said, well, we're going to filibuster the Supreme, Court, uh, the Supreme Court. Now, this has never been done in history, ever, before. They've never, they had the ability to filibuster the Supreme Court, but Democrats. But they always gave them a vote. But Whigs, Republicans, whatever the parties ever were, it's never happened before. Now they said, oh, well, this is a tradition. Well, it's a tradition that never happened before, which I guess can be. And so Schumer said, well, we're going we're gonna to filibuster this. That kind of fell flat because he didn't have the votes in the Senate. So they did a pretty simple, they did the. Um, they, they, they did the nuclear option. Well, that's not, no, it was the Reed option. Yeah, well, well, hang no, on. No, no, it was the Reed option. Because yeah. Reed, Reed is the one who said, look, we've got all these federal judges who really believe that the Constitution is a living document. Living document. And that basically the law is whatever we say it is. Today. Uh, yeah, and well, whatever we've been paid oh. to say it is. And uh, so that's when they did the first thing where they said, uh, we're going to get well, rid of, we're going to fill us. Harry Reed, when he led the Senate, said, we, because you're not letting President Obama's judges get to into the circuits, right, right. that we're gonna we're gonna eliminate the rule for the all judges except for the Supreme Court judges. Right. So when funny enough, when the Democrats said we're not gonna vote, we're gonna do, pull the filibuster, which no one's ever done, regardless of what. Uh, Mr. Schumer said over and over again, it's been done all through history. No, it's never done. It's before. never been done. Never done. And so, no. so his, his what does McConnell first. do? Well, we're just going to skip that rule. That rule's out the window, and now it's well, just no, an I up mean, and down what, vote. what he did, he in, he enforced he enforced the, the Harry Reid yeah. Harry Reid bill. Yeah. And so the Harry Reid rule. So the Harry Reid is the one who came up with this. And so, you know, I mean, these things in Congress, you know, as there's always a pendulum swing from one side to the other. And if one side changes a rule, well, you got to yeah, expect absolutely. that the next time you need that rule, it's not yeah, going to be there. It may not be your rule. It's not, it's not going to yeah. be there. So, um, you know, you know, so, and as far as conservatives go, Neil Gorsuch is pretty moderate as far as conservatives go. Yeah. And probably more moderate than Scalia was. Well, that's the thing. Scalia was, was stricter on all of his decisions. Well, I also think that Scalia was probably more outspoken. Yeah. And I think Neil is a little more diplomatic. If you've listened to what he's what he says yes. and, and, and how he handles himself, mm -hmm. he's a much more reserved fellow. Yeah. And he attracts a lot less attention, whereas Scalia really had no problem well, going, coming right out and stating things in well, pretty, the pretty stark terms. The interesting part is that Mrs. Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch, yeah, Justice is Gorsuch. 49 years old, uh -huh. which means, given the fact that Justice Ginsburg is 80-something. Uh, he's got a few years to go on the bench. And so the idea that... As long as he doesn't go to any of these parties down in uh, Texas. He, he's no, he, he, he always brings his U.S. Marshals <laughs> yeah. with him, and I'll bring think he'll marshals, be okay. As long as you bring the Marshals with you, and there's at least one outside your door, there won't be any needles in the night. Uh, yeah, needles but, in the night. But the, the good thing about this is that... Um, a new president has the right to appoint the justices he wants to well, appoint. I would say if you look at, you know, this appointment, it's a, it's a very moderate appointment. Uh, I think that Schumer made a huge political mistake by doing the filibuster. Because, yes, he did. Because now he's, that rule's gone. That rule's gone. And what no, happens next time? And, and so that's, so basically now Trump's in the position where he, could, he can do a more right-wing justice. Because this was a pretty moderate justice compared I mean, to he, what he could have done. Well, oh yes, and and so you know you so the he Schumer kind of threw this thing down, and I think that was a error. But I think maybe he was doing it maybe as an emotional reaction more than as a well, well thought, of, no, thought actually, out technique. The, actually, what he We're was drum he up had to listen to the drum, far left yeah, base. Yeah, drum up the base. And I think on that we have to think about one thing: the next judge. That's appointed. There won't be any filibuster. It'll be no. There's no filibuster. Bung, bung, bung. You're on. Right. And right. If, uh, if that happens to be well, it kind of depends. But I mean, you don't know what's going to happen in two yeah. years. The Congress may change. The Senate yeah. may change in two years. Well, let's wait and see. So but we'll see on about... that note, what is our third topic tonight, okay. Mark? Okay. Here we're going to talk about something. Um, we're going to talk about medical insurance. 
And uh, medical insur insurance is kind of a shared risk pool when people say, okay, if, if some huge thing happens, some terrible thing, I'm going to put money aside and we'll have other people put in a shared risk pool. That's what you call insurance. And hopefully it never happens. But if it does, if a huge catastrophe happens, then I'll have money set aside to handle that catastrophe. So that's the principle of insurance. Um, now, what happened when you kind of socialize insurance, like they did in Russia and they did in Hungary? Like I've been in the hospital in Hungary, and you know you're waiting in line behind 100 people, and you know the doctor sees you. Well, after what happens if your arms hanging well, off? Well, that's matter. Your blood you know, shooting out. You're that's there the 15 days. You're in line. And then they say the doctor. Yeah, take a ticket. No, the doctor says, "Well, you're going to die," which is always right because you're always going to die. But then what you do, go to the front line, and this was, of course, 20 years ago, and you give them $100 bills, and all of a sudden, whoop, you know, you got good care. So socialized medicine works great as long as you can bribe the doctor. Right. But socialized medicine is a disaster. I mean, they have socialized medicine in Canada that everyone loves it, but they need a heart operation, they fly to the yeah, United States. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I keep hearing this. I keep hearing how great Canada is. But that's great if you have a cold. Right. right? But if you have to have a major surgery no, people now, fly fly people fly. come to a different country. Yeah, people And in fly fact, here. even people from here, they fly to like uh, Thailand right. and uh, countries that have five star hotels as hospitals right. where you have the top surgeons because there's no medical malpractice. But let's draw it back. No, but, but here. So, what happened? You know, we, they decided, like, basically, you know, the, the last administration did kind of a kickback scheme. I think they made $5 billion on a computer program you could have sold for half a million yeah. and and it was a five billion here, ten billion here, thirteen billion here. A lot of money kind of went to oh, the Solyndra. Went to the ro ruling family. Yeah. No of to Obamacare. You know, yeah. it went to the you know, this kind of like uh, these Ponzi scheme kind of like these these Health networks. Well the computers, right. Yeah. The computers and it was like friends that went to college with Michelle and so Well that's the woman out of Canada. Yeah, billions and billions and billions disappeared. And the people who are paying their medical insurance, their, their thing went up a couple, three times. And the people who went in for the socialized insurance realized that their deductibles were so high that they'd have to be run over by a truck to use the insurance. And then everyone else was getting fined. And then they just tripled and quadrupled. And well, you know, they never collected those fines. No, but they couldn't triple the IRS. Well, they've hired more and more IRS agents. But the funny thing, instead of working at Obamacare, most of the IRS agents spent most of their time fixing the election and <laughs> harassing people. But you anyway, so, those, uh... so, so socialized medicine taking over a sixth of the economy, I, I think I did the calculation. The Obamacare, if you project it out, would cost, you know, you could put dollar bills back and forth to the moon. A trillion times. I mean, for the cost overruns. I mean, it's just like a huge cost over, and it was all embezzled money. And so that's due to collapse on the 21st. And so what Trump did, he came in, he said, "Well, I'll try to fix this," which is an unfixable thing because an embezzlement scheme, a Ponzi scheme. How do you fix an embezzlement scheme? It's very hard. Um, but anyway, uh, he said he'd do it, and then the Democrats said, "Oh no, we're not going to cooperate." So he said, "Okay, we're going to let it go." And I think in a month, in a month or so, the Obamacare prices will skyrocket and the thing. Well, much it's will by collapse. the end of April. Yeah, we'll and, uh, and, the, and the, 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 the reason that we're talking about this tonight is because under Medicaid, people don't really have to do anything other than collect their free insurance. And of course, there's other things to go along with that. But there's been a recommendation in Congress to add a work requirement to receiving Medicaid. Now, that work requirement would mean if you're able-bodied, I mean, you, you're supposed to have some job to go along with your Medicaid. The problem is um, there's already about 58% of people on Medicaid do have some paid income in some format. But there is that other 42% that refuse to work. Well, okay, so, yeah, there is. Uh, Speaker Ryan pushed a work requirement for able-bodied adults enrolled in Medicaid. Um, they, you know, so they would uh, end to get, you know, to have them do some work. Um, and then uh, and that's probably why the Democrats didn't want that because they're supposed to, they should be voting, not working. Um, and then they have uh, uh, something about some refundable tax credits towards low to income. But that, like I said, that all died, and I think that may have just been the Republicans said, "Well, let it die and let the thing crash." Because well, what if we go save it? It's kind of like a, it's kind of like if a meat cleaver falls off the counter. Do you try to catch it? Let it. No, let, you let, let it, go. it drop. Let it go. You get it out. So I think that's. And so now I'm talking about some um, secret Trump stuff and some secret gob stuff. Um, we're getting into some uh, pretty, uh, 
pretty are classified, classified top security stuff. Well, what are you stuff. trying to say, Mark? And so, you know, Chief, I think we're going to have to go use the cone of silence. The cone of silence? The cone of silence. Under yeah. what condition do we need to use the cone of silence? Well, Chief, it's government rule 1040. 1040? Yeah, and uh, so we got to, we got to, we got to use it. We got to use the cone of silence. The cone of silence. We have to go to the cone of silence. Okay, here we go. So, chief, I was coming to work today. I missed the train by that much. But by, who's by, listening by, that to much, us? That much. That much. Why are you okay. worried about discussing <laughs> Hong Kong? So, the Obama Kennedy Syndicate or Acorn started in 1991. Acorn. Acorn. What tree is that? Uh oh. Oh, wait a minute. Hold oh, on a second. We'll take off the cone of silence. Oh, there goes the cone. Wait, wait. 88, it's Max. Okay, how's it going? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were going to fly you back, but we missed it by, by that much. By that much. You missed it by that yeah, by much? By that much. Okay, okay, Agent 80. We'll, we'll have to talk later. I'm here with the chief. Okay. So, anyway. Well, um, I'm going to have to tell you the Obamacare that we just talked <laughs> about, and Thank you for informing me of how serious ACORN and Obamacare was. Well, so and here's kind of, and the reason we got to use the cone of science is because uh, apparently Trump was wired up by, uh, by Obama's uh, stellar wind. Stellar wind. The stellar wind. Would yeah. that be the woman like, it, that went before five TV shows right after Benghazi? That wasn't like the summer wind. It's not, this isn't <laughs> like, yeah, this is not uh, uh, my buddy. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, you know, this is this is the the stellar wind, and what the stellar wind means is that instead of getting a FISA warrant, this is so important and such an emergency that the executive branch says we're going to surveil these people. Now, nobody really knows what wiretapping is anymore because there's no more dial-up phones, and and no no one even has shoe phones anymore. And so, nobody has a shoe well, phone. Well, yeah, so. they've been trained tra <laughs> traded in for. Con canvas and, yeah, so, so. and uh, whatever else. I mean, <laughs> so, there's so, just too many So if types. you can call it eavesdropping or surveillance or mm -hmm. hacking, but whatever it is, it's someone listening in on to a private conversation. Should we be looking right now? Well, like, we had the code of silence. Well, that, we that, we, had, we had some problems okay. with that. Okay, so um, so anyway, so Comey was before the uh, Congress the other day, and he said, oh, there was no wiretapping. There Ever. was no spying on oh, Trump. no spying. Which was absolute perjury. And, uh, but, you know, Obama people, well, because Comey's kind of like a lapdog for Hillary. And so, you know, if you look at Eric Holder, remember, yeah. Eric, and his TV show, I mean, you know, these people getting up and perjuring self before Congress is old hat. Well, you Nothing know what? I think, I think we should go back to this in our next show. But for tonight, Mark, I will tell you, we are not going back to the cone of silence, no matter what you say, at any time, I think I, under minute, any condition. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I can see what 88 says about that, wait a minute. <laughs> you mean 99? 99, 99, 99. 88. The chief, the chief, it's 88. the chief, the chief.